Even during the COVID-19 crisis, the energy transition is still a hot topic. Climate change is one of the biggest issues of our generation. He's talking about a green recovery involving investment in low carbon infrastructure. What exactly is the energy transition? How will it affect the energy industry in the UK and around the world? Who is it going to be affected and how will it impact the people coming into the industry? Hello and welcome to the next installment of Energy Institute Young Professional Network Myth Busting the Energy Transition series of interviews. My name is Yash Pajoria. I'm a committee member in the Energy Institute's Young Professional Network. I've been working in the energy industry for about three years in various onshore and offshore roles. I currently work for Crystal and I'm a well decommissioning engineer. And here we have Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Henry. I'm also a committee member for the Energy Institute Young Professional Network. I work for a company called Francois Rochelle Catering as commercial manager, and I've been working in the service sector for oil and gas for the last decade. So for any of you who might not be familiar with PN, we're a group of young professionals in the energy industry who organize events for young professionals so they can network, learn more about the different uh, parts of the industry and grow. So today we're really lucky to welcome Phil Kirk, who's the CEO of Crystal, to discuss the energy transition. So Phil, could you just introduce yourself? I'm Phil Kirk. I'm CEO of a company called Crystal. We're uh, the largest independent EMP company in, in the UK and pretty close to Europe. Uh, we, on a good day, we're producing thousand barrels a day, equivalent of, of oil and gas. And we have uh, probably ran about 600 or more people offshore and probably about a thousand in the office at, in normal circumstances. That being the uh, operative word, normal circumstances. Absolutely, yes. Uh, a big support of the Energy Institute. I'm a fellow of the Institute. Uh, I think it's a really good thing for young professionals, young people, all the way through the career. In your opinion, Phil, what is the biggest myth that you believe exists in regards to the energy transition? It, it concerns me that so many people think it has nothing to do with them and that other people are going to deliver the energy transition. And, and I guess for me, everybody in the country, in the world, will play a role and has to play a role and has to look at their own behaviours and take some responsibility. And, and I don't think that's quite a myth, but I, I see a lot of people who it's just ancillary to their lifestyle. It's not considered. Uh, it's not considered that they should use less. They should be more aware of what they consume where they get the goods from and the supply chain and the energy supply chain behind those goods and services. So I, th I think uh, busting the myth, particularly in the UK, that it will just happen without everybody putting their shoulder to the wheel. I think that would be something, if we could achieve that, we would be going a long way towards achieving the, the energy transition. What does the energy transition mean to you personally and to Crystal? Personally, and, and, and to Crystal, um, I'm, I'm pretty good about thinking where I buy things from. And uh, if you were, if you were at the, the dinner in Aberdeen a couple of years ago, you'll learn a little bit about my background. And I, I am somebody who looks as to where the goods are British made and thinks and, and worries about where, they've, where, where things have been made and, and how, how they've been made. For my sins, I buy British cars, and it was a struggle to buy. Uh, uh, and I've got a plug-in hybrid, and and uh, I, I and I've only ever owned one diesel car, and that was accidentally. Uh, and and but I did buy a plug-in hybrid, and I wish there was more choice for for consumers, and they were more aware of of, of how, what a difference that choice can make. Uh, so that's fine for me. Um, I'm pretty, pretty generally good about, as I say, energy efficiency. I've used public transport more a, a lot. Uh, I barely filled the plug-in hybrid car up with petrol, to be honest. In the in the in the in the eighteen months I've owned it, it's mainly been run off lecky because you just do a ten-mile journey here or there, and that's more than you know. It's more than good enough. Uh, it's only been longer journeys and used petrol. So we do try as a, a family, pretty good at recycling, 
and I guess thinking about things is 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 important. For Chris, or I guess it's it's more fundamental. And you know, we we look at I look at the core values that that we talk about and what's important to us. And one of those is, is for our stakeholders, which means everybody, not just shareholders, it means anybody who's interested in Crystal to be proud of what we do. And we, we try and live by those standards. And I think particularly as I look at the oil and gas industry, we've got to get our heads around, we, have, it, we are part of the energy transition, we are part of the solution. There's lots of things that our products have no substitution at the moment. There's nothing else that can deliver what those products are, whether it's transportable energy intensity, or whether it's lubricants, or whether it's feedstock for other raw materials. But, but that isn't good enough. We've got to deliver it in a way, those products in a way that society is happy with. It's no good just saying they're wrong or we don't agree. Climate change is a fact. The, 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 the direction we're heading is, is, a, is a fact. We can't just ignore it and say we're right. And I guess I want to, tr we're trying to position Chris or without shouting about it to, to produce our products in a way that people would be happy with in the UK. So I think for, for the government and for ourselves, I can see indigenous, indigenous hydrocarbons should be part of an energy mix all the way through to 2050 and, and potentially beyond. But it's massively important that they're produced with responsibility in, in, in a net zero fashion, if we can, as soon as we practically can, safely, but also that contributes to jobs, skilled jobs, engineering jobs, and, and, the, and high paid jobs, which, which, is, which is unusual. Our industry is a high paid, high paid, relatively high paid industry. So for me, transforming us to still be an, a, a, an oil and gas company, but with uh, interests in carbon capture, in hydrogen, moving maybe our supply of methane to more towards a supply of hydrogen over time, but definitely delivering our products as net zero. Yeah, that, that's, what it, that's what it means to me. And, and, and over time, we'll, we'll, we'll be interested in other aspects. But for the minute, you know, we're an oil and gas, co we're an oil and gas company. Uh, I just want to do that in as a responsible fashion from a safety perspective and an environmental perspective and a net zero perspective as we can. And that's back to that to be proud of testing. We can be proud of what we do and talk about it with people and, and society be proud that we've probably got it right. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Um, I wonder if I can delve a little deeper into um, into those areas. You've, you've touched on a few of them already, um, but again, looking at Chris Orr specifically, being an independent, um, what what is it that Chris Orr are doing at the moment to uh, support that climate change challenge, and also looking at um, how does how does that affect you? So, being an independent, how does that affect? the planning to meet oil and gas UK's vision for uh, 2035 as well? Good questions. Uh, but I don't think our ownership status or whether we're independent really, I mean, in a way, that's an advantage. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm co-chair of OG UK uh, and, and so I'm heavily involved with how that agenda is being set and trying to reconcile that agenda with the political landscape with COP26, with the government's 2050 net zero targets down in Westminster and Holyrood's 2045 net zero targets. You know, that is, that's part of the mix that I'm helping with my leadership hat on, helping to try, helping to try and deliver and to try and reconcile all those different moving pieces with, with, different, under, with, with different understandings. Um, for, for us, uh, we, can be rel we can be relatively nimble. We were the first to, to underwrite the uh, industry funding for the ACON project, which has been run out of St. Fergus, which is a, a carbon capture and storage project with a, with a hydrogen production piece tacked on the, tacked on the side. 
and, and, and we're, we're now really pleased to be working with Total and Shell uh, to, take, to take that forward. And I can see that has the ability to potentially not only decarbonize the of St. Fergus production and maybe reduce the carbon footprint of some of the gas, obviously the gas that's, that's been produced offshore and is, is, is sent into the grid. So maybe use some of that hydrogen gas for transportation around Scotland. Maybe also look at decarbonising in the heavy industries down in Grangebeth or, 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 or across the belt, uh, which, which I think is, ex, is really exciting. We can, in a way as well, it's easier for us to point out some of the perils of the political choices. We can... Um, I, I guess what I mean is ju try and join up the picture, uh, maybe 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 more than some of the larger companies that have head offices a lot further away uh, the, the, than ourselves. So try and help the politicians put the framework together without being led by a, by a, a larger, more maybe more global, a slightly different agenda that has to be reconciled to mul multiple jurisdictions. So I think that that's an advantage that we uh, that we, that we have. As as yet, we've not in, we're doing lots of things offshore. We're doing lots of things in the office. And lots of, of of efficiency projects over the over the over the next few years. At the moment, we we've not got into producing renewable energy ourselves, but I do see that in time, not in a five year horizon. You never know, um, but it is something that we would consider. Um, but at the moment, as I say, companies and oil and gas companies. So, in terms of um, your efforts towards the energy transition, yeah, obviously, what's happened recently with COVID nineteen, um, how has that impacted uh, your business and and its efforts towards the transition? It it has. I mean, the COVID nineteen. The, the, the virus pandemic that affected the whole world pretty quickly. Uh, we were, I was going to say lucky, but uh, we, we reacted pretty sharply in, in March and made a decision really early to pull back on offshore activity. We could see where we were heading. We, we were beginning to put contingency plans in place, but we saw the potential risks of having a, a big outbreak offshore, particularly in the middle of doing difficult work, whether you're completing a well or drilling a difficult section or a halfway through a turnaround or a shutdown or, or taking a piece of equipment apart and then you lose key crew or, or can't get pieces of kit or equipment. So we saw that and we pulled back really sharp. Uh, we, we're now testing everybody who goes offshore. So we were the first company to to be uh, proactively testing everybody who mobilises, we put them up in a hotel while we wait for while we wait for the, the results, and that has really let us uh, really reduce the risk of, of offshore transmission, which are now allows us to step work back up. We have still kept, we have a number of things that were going on this year to do with low compression and some. Uh, changes that were being made to valves and equipment that were all targeted at carbon reduction and greenhouse gas re uh, reduction. Some of those are still going ahead. Some have slipped into next year. There's nothing been cancelled, but COVID-19, as it really, uh, our reaction has really meant some of that work has been has been deferred. Not pulled, equipment's all being bought, but you can imagine in March, you look at a, a lot to anything that turns, a lot of exotic valves, quite a bit of exotic steel comes out of northern Italy. Um, you, know, you, you are not going to walk into those projects, let alone with the uh, with the issues that you faced uh, potentially with manpower and the, and the virus transmission. So I don't think that's I don't think that's changed. I think it's interesting that the virus has to, as as focused the government a little bit more in both locations in terms of incentivizing green investment. And I think perversely, oh, careful how I say this, I think perversely COP26 getting delayed 
gives us a much greater opportunity as a, as a country, as the UK, the, 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 the four nations, to actually put some really important pieces in place properly, as opposed to just doing it for the press release, which I'm sure they wouldn't have done. But we now just have, we've seen the imperative, we've seen the opportunity, and actually I'm, I am hopeful that there'll be some really positive things that happen over the next few months and as we run into COP26 next year that lets the UK have a real head start in terms of heading towards net zero and the framework that we need to make for carbon capture, to actually decarbonise heavy industry and, and, and mix all the pieces up for the benefit of the economy. Because I think if we've done it on the fly, there was the risk of unintended consequences. Because this is actually all about how, who pays for what and how is it paid for in terms of the, 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 the economy. And so uh, I think now we've got the time to do it properly and it is still happening at pace, which is really good. So I rambled on a bit and mixed a couple of hours. Oh, that was, uh, but, that was uh, I think, I think it, good to hear. I do hope both governments take advantage uh, of, of our crisis, which where a lot of people have, have died, but actually is an opportunity to learn a lot of lessons and move forward on a good, on a good footing. I take it you see a good opportunity for, um, a, as they coin it, a green recovery. A greener recovery. We all work in the industry, uh, which, which is one of complicated engineering, process engineering, major accident hazard where bad things can happen really quickly. It's not an industry where you can, you can do things on the fly, where you can implement new plans really, really quickly and go and execute complicated engineering projects. What I do hope is there'll be, in parallel with a, a, a return to a more normal level of working offshore, in parallel, the governments will put in place incentives that make the energy transition and some of the green changes you want to happen more quickly and more easily. And, and, and that we can get some of the, the supply chain and some of the workforce focused on those efforts, which will set us up as a country better for the future the more we can uh, the more we can keep that supply chain work here and the expertise and the engineering skills that and and also the commercial uh, skills and legal skills to put those frameworks together the, the the better for people who are joining the industry and the better for for uh, productivity of the country in the future i'm just uh, so paranoid about exporting jobs which i wish more people thought about well, you touched on it earlier, um, but perhaps we might want to expand it a little bit on it. But other oil and gas companies are looking to diversify their portfolios into uh, more renewable assets. Um, what are Crystal's views on developing and diversifying their portfolio? I know you touched on it earlier, but is there anything specific that you are looking to target? You mentioned CCS. I mean, I, I, I talked about the Acon project in, in uh, based at St. Fergus with, with Pale Blue, Dot and Shell and Total and, and another um, an number of local partners around, around St. Fergus, which is a really positive thing. I, hopefully, and again, this is, this is also down to fra legal framework, how it will work. Uh, and, and, and what policy decisions the government wants to make. But given that, I actually hope that would be a really effective CCUS trial project. There are, there are nothing insurmountable on the technical side. Uh, all of the issues are how the legislation and everything will fit together, what commercial and legal framework the governments want, want to put in place. So we aim to be around that and we will subject to the right rules and conditions. We, we look forward to funding that and making it work. We like to make things work. We like to do things. I could see in time how that might step up into a business. It may start at 400,000 400, tonnes a year. But I could see how it might end up at 4 million tonnes of CO2 or even more, and, and maybe importing CO2 from other European countries. I, I think fundamentally, Europe and the UK have got to look at its borders and, and, and potential carbon tariffs to make sure it's a level playing field around the world. But there's no reason why something like the ACOM project at Central couldn't be 
importing and effectively storing other people's uh, CO2 for, for money, which would be the beginnings of a, a business um, and, the, and a pretty responsible one as well. So that seems interesting. And uh, the hygiene piece is massively interesting. Um, I let, let me not be a heretic, but uh, transporting energy in the form of something like hydrogen has got to be more efficient than enormous batteries made of exotic materials dug up in places that you don't want to visit and uh, are probably half done by people who shouldn't be working digging up exotic minerals and metals. Um, so I really see in this country and, and, Scot and Scotland as well, particularly but in this country, if, if we take advantage of it, you know, a real market for hydrogen, heavy goods, uh, trains, public transport, and also it, it, it's, it's, it's a relatively easy transportable fuel. We may have to com compromise with gasoline in, in some uh, less frequented places around the country. But you could see how that would play a really important part, potentially in heating and, and a bit of power as well. Easily transportable, it seems a little point in putting methane to heavy industry to burn that for power if you could put hydrogen uh, and sequester carbon at the, at the point of hydrogen production as opposed to capturing carbon and bringing it back. So I can see how that in the longer term would work and we will be part of that. We're looking at offshore electrification, um, which again, Bizarre, not bizarrely, but uh, a lot of the blocks there come into how the tariff structure works with onshore electri electricity production and the tariffs on it and the prices that have to be charged, which makes it really difficult to take UK power offshore. Perversely, it may be more economic to take Norwegian power. Um, that will change in time. We, we are looking at potentially. And again, this comes into efficiency, but removing some of the machines that we have offshore, uh, power generation packages, and simplifying how many we run, removing redundancy in multiple engines by joining two or three other platforms together, creating a mini grid, which then could be linked to shore in time. So we are, we are looking at that, and that would be fundamental to us reducing our emissions below 50%, I think. We've got pretty good line of sight to 30%, but to get a 50% to need something like that. Ah, sorry, sneezed. Um, Try to wait for a good moment then. Um, so we are looking at that. In terms of wider renewables or carbon sinks like forests and, uh, and marshlands or uh, mangroves, we haven't, we haven't as yet gone there. We've done some research. One of you know, the, the um, I'm backed by a company called EIG Global Partners, which uh, which manage the money that is invested in Crystal. They are widespread investors in wind and alternatives, uh, but through a different fund. So I, in the medium term, I have to reconcile that different flavour of money. You know, they take money off people to invest in a certain area, and obviously they have a an expectation in terms of our environmental standards and how we deliver that. But they have other money that is massively invested in wind and alternatives and, and, uh, and uh, all sorts of things around the world. So in time, we'll reconcile that and I can see us uh, looking at how we, how we marry a little bit of wind power and indeed we've invested in some R&D on the, on the wave technology side uh, and we shall see and the tidal power, we'll see where we get to. Uh, but for the minute, really focused on our CCUS project, the potential for hydrogen and working with, working with our partners, and then efficiency gains and changes offshore, uh, which, which will make a difference. Fantastic. You were able to expand a lot there. <laughs> so that's, that's well, fantastic. We'll see. I mean, I would love, you know, the government, all you look at the Climate Change Committee, you look at all the uh, forward projections, and we're still using a million barrels a day equivalent of hydrocarbons way out in, in 20 or 30 years' time. I would love all of that came from the UK, maybe with a bit of backup as well from Norway and, a, and, a, and an agreed structure, how that worked. But there's no reason why that cannot be net zero supply. Uh, and, yet it, and it's British jobs, and it's British engineering, 
why would that not be a good thing for this country's roadmap? Uh, it, it must be. In the current COVID-19 crisis, a lot of projects have been delayed, as you said, but none of them have been cancelled. How does that relate to the more uh, carbon neutral projects that you've been pushing for? It, it hasn't, it, it, if anything is accelerated, it, it, it has changed. Uh, in fact, there is more political will. And you, you know, uh, ACORN, and this is one of the things governments around the world have got to get their head around, is who pays and how, and how do you avoid a subsidy? So you want to decarbonize energy, and heavy industry, and it's not just energy, but it's heavy industry and it's uh, petrochems, and it's things that you use oil and gas. You want to decarbonize that, but you can't put extra price on those industries because they won't compete globally, and you just you may as well shut them, which is uh, just exporting exporting the carbon and the jobs else elsewhere. And they've got to reconcile that versus well, carbon capture is quite an expensive technology, will get cheaper. There are no, there are a few projects, but not many around the world. We're talking less than 50, and, and not all of those, you know, there are a lot, and there's probably only half up and running, I think. And um, they've got a put a framework in place that, that enables that. And I do see much more of an impetus to, to, to make that happen. You know, some of these projects are gonna, will be hundreds of millions, uh, and industry, will undoubtedly invest, but there has to be a framework. I mean, there are multiple pieces of HSE, health safety legislation, multiple pieces of legislation to do with the, the gas network, if you put in hydrogen in there, to do with multiple regulators, Crown Estate, Opred, Bayes, and all of those pieces have got to join together. I, I can't go and build a carbon capture plant at St. Burgess without all those pieces because it would be illegal, probably a criminal act to, to actually switch the thing on. No, but we all smile because we know that because that's the industry we work in. But actually getting all of the political and, and legislative pieces together from an industry from scratch, it's not like it's developed over 200 years, it's like, let's get it up and running in two or three years. There's a heck of a lot of complexity there uh, around can you make money? Is it a hobby? But actually all the other pieces that need to, that need to come together. And that's what I was saying about COP26 being a bit delayed. I think I see a lot of the civil servants or the politicians have seen that complexity now and they have the opportunity to solve it or at least begin the journey and, and get some trial projects up and running as opposed to just uh, pay lip service and, and make some noise for COP26 and then move on, um, which I think is a great thing for our country if we can, if we can deliver some of these carbon capture efforts. So uh, I have had, funny enough, I've had more inbound on is there space for other partners on these projects of, in the last few weeks than uh, obviously at the time when uh, everybody else was struggling to underwrite it. So, you know, uh, Total, we were in very, very early with Shell and Total joined after working. And, and uh, you know, more recently, a lot of other people are now interested, but uh, the partnership is, 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 is fit for purpose and working really well together. But uh, no, it's, uh, I think we're slightly ahead of the game, which is great. We just need the enabling legislation. Uh, uh, to be put in place. And it will need some of the initial projects like, like offshore wind, you know, it's gonna need some sort of contract difference, some underwritten price of CO2 to actually make it, to make it happen. Uh, but then over time, those subs, you can see uh, that that uh, contract difference will, will wane. And uh, depending on what happens globally, it, it will be a proper business. Um, would be good that it not only support this country's net zero emissions but we can export some of those skills abroad we've just uh, repapered our senior our senior debt and we were in a really strong position before we just put a new facility in place and we have a part of how much interest we pay is now linked to our carbon emissions 
and our emission reduction targets over the next five years. And I think we're the first European independent to actually do that, which I'm really, really pleased with. There's been a lot of work, but really supportive of, 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 our, of our syndicate. And in time, and again, this is, you know, people talk about oil companies and, and energy companies. They, the flavor of money is different that invests in EMP to renewables. And there's also a different class of return and a different investor. And it's quite a, an art to blend that money together for projects. So you know, the fun, if the government can put the framework together for things like CCUS, you know, the funding will come. But it's all down to somebody setting rules of the game in a way that makes sense and delivers their policy objectives. Sorry, I interrupted, but it was interesting. No, that, that's really, really interesting. You've essentially, you're, um, you're, you're twinning uh, financial incentive to carbon policy within the company, which is incredible. Yeah. Plus the inside I've scoop as well. Of, oh, inside <laughs> scoop. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the financial community you know, is, is, is on a journey as well. You know, there's been a, you, two or three years ago, uh, you know, we were looking at low, low compression and looking hand in hand with efficiency and we could see a lot of this, this, this direction coming and we talked about doing things in a way everybody's proud of. It now feels like there's a massive wave and an impetus heading in the same direction. And, and some people are six, nine months behind, some people are ahead or lag in other areas but that uh, the uh, uh, the wagon has been hitched to the horse so um, touching on you we talked a little bit about um, how governments are going to a huge role in the energy transition so where where do you think the responsibility for driving the energy transition itself lies so where where exactly do you think the balance is between the company-led approach, the governmental-led approach, and also the societal-led approach? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for a corporate to lead any government. You, yeah. you can enable, you can spend a lot of your life sitting on work groups and talking to politicians and, and civil servants and trying to show some of the issues and barriers that need to be, need to be knocked out of the way. But basically, it's going to have it has to come down on policy initiative. It's okay to say net zero 2050 or 2045. Brilliant. My kids could say that. No, it was a good thing. How we get there, how we put the pieces in place, what it means for the different parts of society. That's the really tough question that, that is down to, that has to be down to government. Something so new and evolving so quickly you know, it has to be, it has to have a policy framework and it has to have as many pieces as possible, but they have to be clever enough to change it as we go. Mm. I read an interesting piece this week about mobile phone technology, data, data networks, all the different varieties of, of 3G, 4G, 5G, where we're, where, where we're heading. And, you know, there has been over the course of probably 20, 30 years, a number of technology frameworks that have not been perfect and have changed, but at least there has been that policy and, and, and conversations. And I think fundamentally, we need to relook the, the, hopefully there's an energy white paper coming and we will be able to join the pieces, but it's got to come down to the governments. And, and corporates can show the art that possible and can show willing and, and can try and push, but I don't think you can, I might like to try and lead, but uh, I've never managed to completely lead a politician. I think that would be naive of me to think that was, that was possible, if I'm slightly arrogant. We have to be led by the people who direct the politicians and set the framework uh, whilst they look around the world as to what everybody else is doing and how we fit in. Do you think, Phil, as a nation um, for, for the UK, people respond more to, or, or do you think they will respond more towards a, a push towards energy transition or, you know, a forced way or given the option? 
because I suppose we've had the option for the last several decades and the information is now out there, but are we resistant to change? Everybody's a bit resistant to change. Um, it just comes naturally, isn't it? Look at how few people change bank accounts or electricity provider. Uh, and for a lot of people, and I think this is global as well, Richard, it, it comes down to price and, um, and, and, and wealth and balance in society. It is easy for people who are well off in certain areas of the country to be very self-righteous about uh, uh, their lives and the, energy, and the energy transition. It is less easy for, for others who are uh, on minimum wage or have, have, are facing all sorts of difficulties to think that, strate that strategically you don't. You, you think what you can afford and what you need for your family and your kids or, or yourself if you're, on, if you're on your own. So government has got to make it easy, uh, which you know, will need. And this is all back down to who pays and how. And whether it's industry or in society, ultimately society pays. And, uh, and I think that's, that's relatively easy for us to get our head around in this country. When you look globally, you know, and, and you balance all of our climate change targets and the Paris targets, they've got to go hand in hand with the UN development goals. They've got to go hand in hand with education, with, uh, with, with poverty, with, with, with a, whole, a whole suite uh, of other issues that people around the world face more than uh, the people of London and Edinburgh. Or, or some other areas uh, around, around the UK. You know, we are relatively well off as, a, as an average. You know, a lot of people, there's a billion people without electricity um, around, around the world. There are, there are so many who, who are still cooking with uh, bus sticks, you know, even animal dung, with a dream about a kerosene stove. Which, which is probably much, much more uh, much more efficient, and and we've got to we've got to look at the whole we've got to look at the whole piece. And the UK is part of that, but you know you look at sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, you know, there are massive societal issues that need to be reconciled to the Paris targets and the, and the hand in hand with the UN the UN goals. So uh, it, it's got to be government led. How do you see the COVID, how do you see COVID nineteen's long term effect on energy on overall energy demand, if any? Long term, I, I don't see an impact. Yeah. Um, short, medium term, yes, but you're already seeing you know, you're already seeing parts of China getting back to where they were pretty rapidly. I guess it'll depend whether there's another spike whether the virus um, mutates over time, whether we've seen other viruses. Uh, but, but fundamentally, long term, I don't. The demographics of the world, the world population, the, uh, the demand for improvements in, in standards of living mean the, the, the energy demand is only going one way. Um, in, 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 in my view, we just need to find a way where we can do it responsibly without... Uh, as much harm to the environment as we potentially could do, but realising it's a fundamental right for people. Who are we in the Western world to, to deny cheap energy? So yeah, on to um, early career questions. Um, so uh, what are the opportunities for young professionals um, and how can the oil and gas industry attract, retain talent? given the critical and unpredictable nature of the industry? I think the industry is an exciting industry. I think as we, get, as we head down a, the, our net zero path, um, I think it'd be, it, it, it may become easier for some people who are less certain about joining. For people to join it, it can become more, it should become, it is becoming more attractive from, uh, from the point of view of talking to their friends about it and their mates. Um, we do try, as a company, Chris Orris tries to, to ensure everything we do, we can be proud of. I would always hope that people can join companies like ours and see what they can contribute and how we can make a difference over, over time. 
Um, I think as, as companies become uh, more allied to the energy transition, then maybe it will become less cyclical. Um, and I think you, know, you can see as less energy around the world is, is produced from hydrocarbons, the market will be less cyclical. Coming on from that as well, um, what attributes are you looking for in the future employees of Crystal to meet the challenge of the energy transition? Is there any specific attributes you're looking for for that specific challenge? For that specific challenge. Open-minded, looking to solve problems, ability to work hard, bring new, bring new ideas, challenge without being too rude or too sarcastic about old people. Gash is smiling there, <laughs> uh, which is, it almost takes a few years to understand you get, <laughs> you get a better result if you're not rude and tell people they're stupid. But bringing those new ideas and that vision uh, with some, uh, as engineer, as people who are members of the, the Energy Institute will do, bring in some engineering and scientific discipline. That is a powerful combination of science, engineering and vision. That's what we want. And finally, um, what advice would you give to a young professional coming into this industry? Work hard, ask for advice, talk, talk to new people all the time. If you go and work at a company, talk to different people, go and find out other opinions and experience, and that will inform what you might want to do or what you might not want to do. Don't set your path too early, but look for different experiences and more broad experiences. Well, that's, that's all our questions. Um, <laughs> no, Thank I, you, Richard. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much uh, to yourself, Phil, uh, for, for representing Crystal. Um, Emma, thank you for um, helping set this up as well. Um, we've obviously covered off um, around the energy transition and how Chris or as, as an independent EMP, um, how they factor into the, the energy transition. So thank you very much for answering our questions. Um, we'd also like to thank our listeners who are now watching this video. Um, hopefully uh, all the audio and the video is, is fantastic as well. Um, a lot of effort's gone into um, all the committee members that have been involved uh, in setting this up as well. Um, we have got other videos on the same subject as well. So if uh, you haven't watched them already, please uh, go ahead and watch them now. Um, and we'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, CNOC, uh, for supporting our events as well. But no, thank you very much, guys. Uh -huh.